everyone. Happy New Year. I'm Pastor Mike Decker. Say hello, Pastor Mike. Welcome to the Palm Harvest Network and to the Christian Podcast Studio. Wherever you might be tuning in from or watching or listening, super glad uh, that you're here. You know, as we begin a new year, 2023, we are going to pop the cork, so to speak, on a new series that I am calling Legacy. Legacy. Over the upcoming weeks and months, we are going to unpack this coat of arms, and uh, so it'll make more sense as we move forward. You know, can I make the assumption that you want to make a difference in this world? Uh, can I assume that you uh, want to have a positive impact upon the lives of those in your relative circles of, of, of influence? If so, then this series will be right up your alley. You know, throughout the next few months, my goal <clears throat> is going to be to try to help you identify how God is at work in your life and maybe even help you shape, if you will, your own coat of arms to help give you direction for future decisions. So we'll talk about more on that in, in the weeks to come. You know, today, today for many of us marks the launch of a new year, 2023. And so I wanna begin our conversation today with a short prayer. Are you down for that? And so if you're in a place, if you're watching this online, or maybe you're just listening, if you can comfortably uh, seat yourself, and then uh, if you've been around Palm Harvest Church for very long, you'll often encourage you to kind of put the palms of your hands out in front of you uh, with your palms uh, up, faced upward and um, open and upraised. And then I just want you to take a, a deep breath and inhale and hold it for a moment. So just inhale, hold it. Now exhale, just trying to center down. As you inhale again, just pray to say, God, I want more of you, hold it. And as you exhale, say, God, I want less of me. Now pray this in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm here to meet with you. Please meet with me. And please speak to me today through Pastor Mike as we study your word, the Bible, together. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Now, if you have a Bible close by, whether it be in paper or digital form, I invite you to turn in it to the book of Exodus. Exodus is the second book from the beginning of the Bible. It's Genesis, then Exodus, and so it should be a fairly easy book for you to identify in paper form. And once you find Exodus chapter 2, I want you to turn to, or rather, ex, the book of Exodus, I want you to turn to chapter 3. So Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to look at today. Today in uh, chapter 3, we are going to be introduced to a man whose life story you are likely very familiar with. And as we read his story, I want you to pay attention to the steps that he goes through that ultimately helps him navigate a major transition in his life. Okay, so Exodus chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, and we're, today we are going to discuss a growth recipe for 2023, a growth recipe for 2023. And the first two ingredients of this recipe are found here in these first three verses. So look at verse one, follow along as I read, picture the scene in your mind, and see if you can identify what these two ingredients are. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning fire in the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. 
I must go see it. Now, for those of you who are taking notes, write this down, point number one. Stay curious, stay observant. Stay curious, stay observant. Brothers and sisters, is it your desire to grow this coming year, to grow in your relationship with God and with your fellow man? then curiosity and observation are key ingredients for you and I to practice regularly if we want to accomplish that feat. Stay curious, stay observant. You know, here in our Bible story, we are introduced to a man by the name of Moses. Moses, we are told, is a shepherd who is out tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. While out one day on the Mount of Sinai, the Bible tells us that Moses observes an unusual sight. He sees a bush that is on fire, but apparently it's not being consumed. And this observation stirs Moses' curiosity, which then sets into motion a God encounter. Friends, when you think about this year, 2023, Is it your desire to experience a God encounter? You know, have you ever noticed how we as humans are creatures of habit? You know, we tend to repeat the same behaviors and and routines and, and make the same choices over and over again. You know, for example, when we go to a church building, many of you are part of a church congregation, we'll often sit in the same seat week after week. Or when we, you know, visit or fraternize or go out to eat at some of our favorite restaurants, often we will order the same menu item, rarely venturing out and, and trying something new. You know, as we get older, age threatens to slow us down, leading, I think, to this path of, of taking leading us to make the choice of taking the path of least resistance. And maybe there's some some wisdom in that. But what I'm suggesting is practicing curiosity and observation with intentionality is something that we have to really go after if we want to experience a vibrant life. Because curiosity and observation are two key ingredients for exposing us to God encounters. Something for you and I to consider. You know, in the spirit of curiosity, what do you think Moses looked like? Have you ever thought about that? You know, did Moses have long hair and a beard? Or was he bald and clean shaven? Did Moses wear colorful clothing like what one might find in Egypt? Or did he choose to wear cotton linen that was white or beige in color to help keep him cool during the hot summer months, you know, while outdoors, caring for his sheep? Was his skin dark in color, tanned and weathered perhaps from spending really years outside in the harsh, unforgiving, dry and sunny Egyptian climate? What did Moses look like? You know, in my mind, I visualize Moses carrying in his hand a shepherd's staff carved from wood. It was a tool Moses would use for protecting his sheep and maybe something even to lean on when trying to walk over and navigate the hilly terrain upon which his sheep would eat. You know, on his feet, I imagine Moses wearing leather sandals, perhaps, you know, closed on the front to protect his toes from rocks and and bush. And although he was 80 years old at the time of this Bible story here in Exodus chapter 3, in my mind, I envision him to be relatively uh, in good shape. Not overweight, not much fat, but rather trim, right? And fluid in his movements. You know, I don't know what Moses looked like. The Bible doesn't tell us. But what does seem 
to be obvious here in this Bible story is that Moses was a man who practiced curiosity and observation, and it was these two ingredients that led him to encounter God. Now write this down, point number two. Growth requires change. Growth requires change. Look at verse 4 in your Bibles here in Exodus chapter 3. This is what we read. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Now let's stop there for a minute. Why do you think God told Moses to take off his sandals? Why ask Moses to remove his shoes? Didn't God know that shepherds needed sandals to protect their feet? Didn't God know that at 80 years of old, removing your shoes is a bit of a challenge? Clarence, would you agree with that? You know, I find it interesting that God didn't instruct Moses to kneel before him. God didn't say, hey, Moses, get down on your hands and knees and, and bow before me. No, God only told Moses to remove his sandals. Millie. Why did God tell Moses to remove his sandals? Well, you say, Pastor Mike, Moses was on holy ground. That's what the Bible says. So he needed to honor God by taking off his shoes, right? I don't know. Do you think that Moses' feet may have smelled a little bit? That doesn't sound very honoring to me, does it to you? Think about this. Moses is 80 years old. His feet had likely walked thousands of miles. His toes were probably looking worse than a professional soccer or hockey player, right? Bent, crooked, his skin calloused and leathery. You know, I doubt very much that Moses had pretty feet. So why ask Moses to remove his sandals? You want to know what I think? I think that God's request for Moses to remove his sandals was a figurative metaphor. Now, yes, I believe that God did want Moses to remove his sandals. And yes, I believe that Moses did in fact remove his sandals. But this burning bush encounter wasn't about Moses' feet. Rather, it was about Moses' destination, Moses' legacy. To me, it seems like God was saying, Hey, Moses, I have a new life assignment for you. So I want you to set aside your shepherd footwear, and I want you to put on instead your soldier footwear. Ready yourself and put on the footwear of a battle-tested warrior because I got a job for you to do. Friends, growth requires change. So get rid of your sandals. You're not going to need them anymore, God told Moses. Take them off. Take them off. Now think about this. In your life right now, where is God inviting you to change? Anything come to mind? You know, in what arena of your life might God be inviting you to surrender or perhaps hold a looser grip on? Friend, change is an ingredient, an important ingredient in God's growth recipe. Now understand this, and this may be the hardest part, point number three, and that is that change is often disruptive. Change is often disruptive. You know, if you 
were to read on in the book of Exodus, you would read how God's foot assignment <laughs> led to a people assignment. God asks Moses to re return to Egypt, to his hometown, which he had fled 40 years earlier. Are you all familiar with Moses' backstory? Let me share it with you. If you just go back one chapter to Exodus chapter 2, you will read how Moses had been born in slavery. Moses' mom and dad were Jews. They worked as slaves in Egypt. But because of a miraculous circumstance, the Bible tells us that Moses was set free through adoption and then subsequently raised in Pharaoh's court. Now, as a, a child of Pharaoh's court, I think it's safe for us to assume that Moses was received probably the finest education. Certainly, he lived in a household that boasted incredible wealth and affluence. But then at the age of 40 years old, Moses made a terrible moral mistake. A mistake that changed the trajectory of his life. Do you remember what it was? Moses, the Bible tells us, killed somebody. But not just anybody. Moses killed an Egyptian supervisor, which made things even worse. And although Moses had been raised in Pharaoh's household, Moses knew that he was in, he was in deep trouble. And so to avoid sort of punishment, the Bible writer tells us that Moses fled. And for the next 40 years of his life, up until the time of this burning bush experience, Moses lived in relative obscurity. He got married. He had a couple of kids. And to provide for his family, he worked as a shepherd, taking care of his father-in-law, Jethro's, sheep. But then one day, as we read earlier, while out doing his duties, God grabbed Moses' attention. And in so doing, God disrupted Moses' life. Change is usually disruptive. Friend, have you ever had your life disrupted by God? You know, a relationship with him can do that at times. But you know what I love about Moses' legacy? It's the fact that his colorful backstory didn't prevent God from using him and working through him. And that truth gives me hope. Because it suggests to me that God can work through my life and he can even work through your life. Our backstory, our colorful past, doesn't necessarily prevent God from moving us and using us forward. But remember, change is usually disruptive. Look at verse 9 in uh, chapter 3, and let's, let's see what else we're told here. Then the Lord told him, Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. Friends, have you ever argued with God? If you have, you need to know that you're in good company. Because Moses, as we read here, wasn't too keen on going back to Egypt, was he? In fact, if you read on in this story, you will read how Moses continues to kind of have this back and forth argument with God. Moses says, listen, God, I'm not the right guy for this job, right? Pick somebody else. To which God says, no, Moses, you're the right guy. Don't worry, I'll be with you. To which Moses replies, no, God, I'm not that good. I don't talk that good. In fact, you know who really talks good is my brother, my brother Aaron. Ask him. He's a good talker. He's the right guy for this job. God, I got baggage. And to which God responds, no, Mo, you're, you're the perfect man for this job. In fact, 
We'll do this together. I got you, Mo. I'll go with you. So who do you think won that argument? Well, you know. The Bible tells us that Moses finally relents. He obeys God's invitation. He travels back to Egypt, and after performing a myriad of miracles with God's help, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, makes the decision to release the Israelites from their captivity. And they all lived happily ever after, right? Wrong. If you know the Bible story, you know that before the Israelite nation are totally free and clear of Egypt, Pharaoh changes his mind. And immediately, in his anger and in his, up, you know, just being upset with this decision that he had made, he dispatches his entire Egyptian army to bring the Israelites back. Now picture this scene in your mind. The Israelite nation, millions of people with all their livestock and family members, are now standing along the shoreline of the Red Sea. You know, geographically, the Red Sea is this vast, ginormous body of water. You know, hit, I don't know, people of, of, of the land, they tell us that it's 169,000 square miles of, of liquid. At its deepest point, it's 9,000 feet. In fact, at its widest point, it's 170, 190 miles wide. And so here the Israelites are standing on the shorelines of the Red Sea. They got no boat, trying to figure out a way to cross the, these waters. When all of a sudden behind them, they see the Egyptian armies coming down full blown speed with chariots and horses. And clearly, it's not a good situation to be in. And this is what we read in Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. Picture this in your mind. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and they panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to, Lord, to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better for us to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Well, some truth to that. You know, brothers and sisters, have you ever experienced a time in your life when you ventured out on a dream or on a new idea and things didn't go so well for you? You know, maybe you hit a roadblock or you encountered some insurmountable, or at least it felt like an insurmountable obstacle, and suddenly found, you found yourself questioning, did I make the right choice, right? Have you ever been a, in a place like that? Have you ever heard yourself say these two words? If only. If only. If only I could do things over. If only I could go back in time and make a different choice. If only... And you fill in the blank. Friend, where in your life are you tempted to go back? You do know, don't you, that the good old days were never really that good? You just forgot how bad and miserable they were. Because I've learned, and I suspect many of you have too, that time has a way of ma masking and minimizing our pain. So consider this. How open are you to have God disrupt your plans in 2023. Will 2023 this be a year for you to take off your sandals and venture out onto a new kingdom assignment? Where is God inviting you to trust him? Where is God inviting you to join him? And what fears from your past 
is God inviting you to face? Friends, with God's help, I challenge you to live your life with your eyes on tomorrow. Don't live in the past. Rather, stay curious. Stay hungry. Stay observant. And with God's help, keep growing. Is this a message that you need to hear today? Listen, as you navigate your future, remember this, and this is my final point. Don't discard your past. Build on it. Don't discard your past. Build on it. When navigating your future, especially for those of you who are experiencing transition right now in your life, and maybe life is feeling a little bit scared and unsettled, don't discard your past, rather build on it. Let me explain. You know, when we read Moses' story after encountering God in the burning bush, after debating with God about whether or not he was the right guy for the job, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, before Moses goes to, to Egypt, the Lord asks Moses this question. He says, what is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? To which Moses replied, a shepherd's staff. A shepherd's staff. Now this is really important, so don't miss it. Moses eventually goes to Egypt, right? He eventually agrees to God's call in his life, and with God's help, he frees the Egyptian, or rather the Israelites, from their slavery in Egypt. And throughout his journey, in every encounter that Moses had with Pharaoh, guess what he was carrying in his hand? That shepherd's staff. Now when we fast forward to Exodus chapter 14, we read how the Israelite nation is now in trouble. They have fled Egypt only to discover that the Red Sea now is blocking their movement forward. The water is in front of them. The Egyptian army now is now behind them. And the Israelites find themselves sandwiched in between with nowhere to run. Obviously, they're scared for their life, and rightly so, and so they do what you and I might have done had we been in their place. They start screaming at Moses. Why didn't you leave us alone? Why didn't you let us suffer in, in slavery? At least we'd be alive and not dead. And if you read Exodus 14, you can read how Moses is obviously feeling the pressure because he apparently also starts screaming at God. Because in verse 15 of Exodus chapter 14, pay close attention to what God says to Moses. I love this. This is really important. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand above the sea. Pick up your staff and raise your hand above the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk across the middle of the sea on dry ground. Did you capture what just happened? Moses wasn't in trouble. The Israelite nation weren't standing in harm's way. Moses had all the tools that he needed to navigate this Egyptian dilemma. He was holding the key to, to this puzzle in his hand the entire time. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Pick up your shepherd's staff. You know, that stick in your hand? That thing that you've been carrying around for the last 40 years out with the sheep? Moses, now would be a good time for you to use it. Raise your hand above the sea. Divide the waters so that the Israelites can walk through the middle on dry ground. Now, don't miss this. Moses 
God was saying, I have given you everything you need for this journey. Don't discard your past. Build on it. Friends, God never wastes an experience. You hear me say that all the time. God never wastes an experience. You know, one of the truths that God has taught me about life and leadership is that the answer is in the room. The answer is in the room. Translation, God has given you and me every tool that we need to accomplish the mission that he has called us to do. And many times we are holding the solution to our problems in our hand. It's found in our life experiences. It's found in the people who we're a part of, a, of, of a, on a team with. It's right in the room. The answer's in the room. Listen to me, and I'm going to close with this. Some of you are watching today or listening today, and you're trying to decide what next steps you should take. As you strive to gain clarity, as you strive to gain really some kind of understanding how to move forward, I want to suggest to you, I am suggesting to you, the part of the answer to the questions that you are asking is already in your hand. Don't discard your past, build on it. Don't discard your past, build on it. We are in this new series called Legacy. Here again is the logo. And if you look up at the top left-hand portion of this logo, you'll see this shepherd staff. We'll talk more about this in the weeks to come. But the question I want you to close and spend some time thinking on this week is, what is in your hand? What has God placed in your hand? You know, as a homework assignment for this series, I want you to begin to make a list of life experiences and responsibilities that God has given you. You know, go all the way back to your birth and make just kind of make your way forward to the present time and ask the question and kind of just jot down some notes, what is in your hand? What unique skills and experiences, both painful and joyful, has God given to you to help shape you and really make your life story unique? What's the color in your story? I want to encourage you to start to list those things out because down the road, I'm going to help you use those things to create something, okay? So if you have any questions or you need to you know, get any further clarification, feel free to reach out to me here at mike at palmharvest.com or reach out to me through our Palm Harvest app. I'd be more than happy to coach you uh, on this assignment. So it's time is up. I've spoken long enough. Let's finish with one closing prayer. Okay, so again, put everything down, get comfortable, take a deep breath, inhale, you know, just say, God, I want more of you in my life. As you exhale, I want less of me. Put your hands out in front of you, palms up raised, open in a place of surrender, and just pray this in your heart and mind and soul. Say, Heavenly Father, please help me to stay curious and observant. And please help me to trust you when life gets disruptive. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.